Yeah, actually, I was with the, I'll get the, the title right. So the, yeah. the Rhode Island Historical Preservation and Heritage Commission was the agency I was a, a consulting folklorist for for uh, 35 years. I was a, a consulting folklorist, and that means I, uh, I basically wasn't on anybody's salary. I didn't get benefits. Uh, so I did project after project after project, and uh, I acquired quite an archive of, of folk life and material for the state of Rhode Island. Uh, most of it is not digitized, because when I began doing this work in 19, actually in 1979, for the American Folk Life Center at the Library of Congress, uh, we were using open reel Nagra tape recorders and cassette recorders. So I've gone through several technologies to the point now where I can record on uh, little chips, but it's a real problem getting all this technology into a, a form that's that you can preserve. And that's why I keep saying technology is our friend, hopefully. Well, I was going to start off with a sort of kind of apology related to an incident that that, that occurred back in, oh, a long time ago, in the early 1990s, when I was talking at one of the schools in Providence, a college that's well known for turning out the best artists in the world. So people there are supposed to be very creative and imaginative. And I gave a talk on, the, uh, on vampires in Rhode Island or New England. And afterwards, one of the students came up and said, you know, Dr. Bell, you've destroyed my image of a vampire. And I, I was starting to apologize. And then I stopped myself and I said, wait a minute, thinking this person is supposed to be one of the most imaginative students that we have in the country or perhaps in the world. And she's got an image of a vampire that gets destroyed by me talking about things that actually happened. So if I destroy your image of a vampire, I'm sorry, but not too sorry. <laughs> I just hope you have room in your vampire idea box for at least one more kind of vampire. Well, if I tell you that scores of people, perhaps hundreds of, that were dead, that is corpses, were exhumed and mutilated and sometimes partially consumed in America beginning in the latter part of the 18th century and continuing to the mid 20th century. That's right, the mid 20th century. You have every right to wonder how such things could have happened. The latest case, which was 1949, did not occur in, in New England. It was in the mountains of southern Pennsylvania, so I won't talk about that, but it's a very, very interesting case. But I believe the only way we can really wrap our heads around what was going on, and that includes me as well as you, is to take ourselves out of the 21st century. Because the people 150, 200 years ago were living in a very different culture than we live in today. We may occupy the same space. We may be direct descendants of the people that lived there. But this is not the same culture. So if you want to close your eyes and transport yourself back in time, and imagine yourself walking through a village in New England with dirt streets. There are other people walking. There are horses being ridden. There are horses drawing wagons. People are riding in buggies or coaches. Now think about what you're not seeing with that image. In this world, there are no iPhones, no texting, no computers, no internet, OMG, no FB, LOL, no TV, no movies, no automobiles, traffic signals, interstates, no airplanes flying over. Uh, this is the world that nourishes vampires. Well, my introduction to this world was through a, an Exeter, Rhode Island farmer whose name was Lewis Everett Peck. 
he was a self-described swamp Yankee, which I think would be equivalent in some places to hillbilly or other such titles. If he called himself that, it was a compliment. If I put that moniker on him, it would not probably be taken as a compliment. He also called himself a jack of all trades. And I was in the southern part of Rhode Island in 1981, just beginning a project funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities to do a survey of folk cultural traditions in what they, we call South County. Officially, it's Washington County, but no one's ever called it that in Rhode Island. It's South County. And I was told by the person who introduced me to Everett, now you be sure to ask him about the vampires in his family. Well, he lived at the end of Sodom Trail in a little village, and he was the, his was the only house there at this time that was called Sodom. So here I am driving down a dirt road, basically alone in an isolated, desolate place <coughs> named Sodom, and I'm going to interview a man that had vampires in his family. <laughs> and this was my first experience with actual vampires. You can imagine I did have a queasy feeling, but once he invited me inside and I sat down on the couch, and it was a November day in 1981, almost, my gosh, 34 years ago already. Uh, he had the wood stove going. He's leaning on it, I don't know how, without burning himself in this picture. And he sat down and he thumbed through a pile of newspaper clippings and pulled out one and handed it to me. And he asked me to read what was the headline. So I did, it said, in small type, they burned her heart, and then large, bold letters underneath that was, was Mercy Brown a vampire? And then Everett began to tell me his tale of Mercy Brown, sometimes pointing to that newspaper during his story to emphasize certain points. I'd like to play a very short excerpt, but a very important part of that uh, interview. <coughs> I've transcribed it up here, because he's speaking in a southern Rhode Island dialect, and it may sound strange to your ears. I'm not sure, but you can follow along on the text. Brown was a relative. I can't tell you right now how we're related, but we are related. My grandmother was a Brown. And it was told to me as a kid, you know, from my mother, uh, Decoration Day was one of the big days, and Children's Day was one of the big days around here. You didn't go to a fire around here, you know. And when we went to the cemetery, there was Mercy Brown, right side of the, you know, just one lot or two over from where my parents are, you know, all buried, they are now. And they say, well, don't go run over there because don't touch the stone because of this awful thing that took place years ago, you know. They, what they do here, they change the around as if I believe in vampire. He pointed that newspaper. Now, that ain't what I'm saying. I'm just revealing <coughs> what they believed and how they had to handle their own problems, see? So anyway, over there was this stone, and there had been several in the family. They had uh, come down with some disease, young and old, all of a sudden. And <coughs> any things they did, didn't seem to stop it. Even uh, even those that didn't even live here, as far away as in Ohio, at okay. the same time, his brother was coming down with the same sickness. So there was 12 men, as it's told to me, of the family that was left. They got together and they figured it was all their turn. This is it. And they got together and they took a vote what to do, and they dug up one grave, not several. They dug up Mercy. For some reason, they picked her because there was something there that led it to that. And they dug her up, and she had turned over in the grave. Well, right away, there's a lot of problems there. So they took her out, you think and they cut her heart out. There was blood in the heart. Well, they decided they had to kill it. 
And so they started a fire right not far from the grave, and they burnt the heart, took the ashes and done something with them. I don't, I don't remember that stuff there, but anyway. And it seems that that's what took care of it. You know, years ago, you didn't have medicine. You didn't have nothing. You, you, you had to figure out your own. There were self-independent people. Everybody lived here. There was no such thing as relying on somebody. You did it yourself. <coughs> so, I think to demonstrate that his story had some actual credibility, he took me out to some physical sites to show that this is where things happened. This is the Exeter Grange on the left, which is next to the Chestnut Hill Baptist Church, behind which is the cemetery where the Brown family are buried. The Grange is where they would go on Children's Day, which was the last day of school in June. And then on Decoration Day, which is, of course, Memorial Day, the kids would go over playing on the, the gravestones, and the elders would say, now don't go over there on that stone, and don't touch that stone because of this awful thing that took place years ago. So every year, maybe twice a year, the same story would have to be told to the up-and-coming kids over and over again uh, to explain that particular proscription or taboo. The family's gravestones gave me names and dates that I could research because by that time I really wanted to know, did this really happen? What happened? And believe me, I was thinking about following up with research on Everett's incredible story. But you can see from the gravestones, Mary Eliza, the wife of George Brown, died in 1883, and his daughter, Mary Olive, died in 1884. That's Mercy Brown's gravestone. She died January 17, 1892, at the age of 19. And he showed me the stone not far from her uh, gravestone, where he said they, <clears throat> they took her heart and burned it to ashes. Well, my main concern after this interview was to see if I could find some actual documentation of this event. And it really didn't take too long, because I had some dates. And I found uh, the Providence Journal article for March 19, 1892. And this is how they introduced the Brown family to Rhode Island and the rest of the world, because this story was picked up and published all around the, the country and even in other parts of the world. Test, exhumed the bodies, testing a horrible superstition in the town of Exeter, bodies of dead relatives taken from their graves. They had all died of consumption, that's the mysterious illness, <clears throat> and the belief was that live flesh and blood would be found that fed upon the bodies of the living. Well, I found pretty good agreement between Everett's story and the newspaper articles. Uh, but there are some discrepancies that I think are worth pointing out. Everett said a brother as far away as Ohio was coming down with the same sickness. Actually, it was Mercy's recently married brother, Edwin, who had gone to Colorado Springs hoping for a cure, which unfortunately did not work. So he came back to Rhode Island. In the meantime, Mercy had died of so-called galloping consumption, which seemed to be asymptomatic until all of a sudden, in a several weeks, she's dead. Uh, and that was in January of, of 1892. So Colorado Springs is probably what he was talking about when he said as far away as Ohio, same family coming down with the same sickness. It's probably Edwin. Uh, the newspaper accounts state that the bodies of George Brown's wife and both daughters were unearthed. Everett said, if you recall, and they dug up one grave, not several. They dug up Mercy. For some reason, they picked her because there was something that led it to that. So I started getting goosebumps as a folklorist when I hear that, because maybe a historian gets nervous when he starts hearing different versions of the same thing. <coughs> I get excited because I think I'm in the territory of folklore, perhaps. Maybe this is a legend in the making. And there's no mention in the Providence Journal article of Mercy having turned over in the grave. Now, if that had happened, don't you think the eyewitnesses who were there reporting this story might have mentioned that? <laughs> Given the state of journalism <coughs> in the 1890s? Probably. 
And then finally, Everett says, Mercy's heart was cut out, and then to quote him, they burnt her heart, they took the ashes and done something with them. I don't remember that stuff there. According to the newspaper, both the heart and liver were removed and burned. And the article stated, quote, to make the cure certain, the ashes of the heart and liver should be eaten by the person afflicted. Which would have been her brother, Edwin. Uh, the local medical examiner, Dr. Harold Metcalf, whom the newspaper reported as being in attendance to evaluate the situation at the exhumation, he didn't know whether or not Edwin actually ingested the ashes, but in any event, Edwin died uh, May 2nd of that year, 1892. The journal article also states that, quote, all mention of the vampires omitted from this account of the exhuming, but this signifies nothing. The correspondent simply failed to get to the bottom of the superstition. And so to remedy the oversight for the local correspondent, they placed Mercy Brown's exhumation in the context of European vampire traditions by quoting from the Century Dictionary. And this is that, that's the quote. A vampire is a kind of spectral being or ghost still possessing a human body, which according to the superstitions existing among the Slavic and other races of the Lower Danube, leaves the grave during the night and maintains a semblance of life by sucking the warm blood of men and women while they are asleep. But this vampire, the unseen killer that was destroying the Brown family, didn't seem to resemble this dictionary's description of a vampire, uh, which for many of us would probably look very much like someone we've seen several times already today. The clever and aristocratic Count Dracula. But, in fact, the Brown family's vampire was so small that it was invisible, unless you had a microscope, which is, helps explain why this vampire remained the mysterious killer until 1882. And that's the year that Robert Koch, a German scientist, announced the discovery of the tuberculosis bacillus. So I hate to break it to you, America's authentic vampires were actually at least from the vantage of the scientific community, pathogenic microbes. That is disappointing. So you might say they're bacteria with fangs. Does that help a little bit? <laughs> but a good question is, you know, what do vampires and tuberculosis germs have to do with each other? And I think the link between those two is explainable by how closely accounts of vampire attacks match up with the symptoms of consumption as tuberculosis or the lungs was called at that time. Uh, unlike smallpox or yellow fever, consumption usually was a slow burning disease killing by degrees. So both consumptives and vampires really are the living dead. Consumptives are walking corpses, they're waiting to die because they're wasting, they're pale, they embody disease and death. And on the other hand, you could say vampires are the embodiment of consumption, which is an evil that is unseen, but it's still able to drain away life slowly, slowly, slowly. And victims of consumption complain most at night because they're lying on their backs sometimes and they wake up coughing and in pain. Sometimes they describe a heavy feeling, like something, something or somebody sitting on the chest and as the disease progresses, ulcers develop in the lungs and they develop cavities. They're coughing up more and more blood, so teaspoons become cupfuls of blood. So in the morning, a relative will come in and see Mercy, for example, lying in the bed with blood at the corners of her mouth and blood on her bed clothes. And you say, my gosh, something, someone is draining the blood, the life out of Mercy <coughs> Brown. In an essay on pulmonary tuberculosis, written in 1799, a doctor described one of his patients. But if you read the description of this consumptive patient and look at Max Schreck from 1922 movie Nosferatu, I don't know which one is being described. They're interchangeable. 
The emaciated figure strikes one with terror. The forehead covered with drops of sweat, the cheeks painted a vivid crimson, the eyes sunk and the little fat that raised them in their orbits entirely wasted. The pulse is quick, tremulous. The nails are long, bending over the ends of the fingers. The palms of the hand dry and painfully hot to the touch. The breath offensive, quick, and laborious. Vampire consumptive. And during the 1700s, tuberculosis infections began to increase dramatically in America. And by 1800, almost 25% of all deaths in the Northeast was attributed to consumption, which is about the same death rate as cancer today. So I think you can imagine the fear and alarm that people had when somebody in the family contracted consumption. And it, it remained the leading cause of death in America throughout the 1800s. And despite many, many, many claims by the medical establishment, by quack doctors, by patent medicine salesmen, this is an illustration, by the way, for the, uh, the blood doctor elixir, which was supposed to cure consumption. But in the end, the diagnosis of consumption was basically a death sentence. And so again, I ask you to transport yourself back one or two centuries. You do not know that consumption is caused by a germ, but you know it's contagious and you know it's deadly because you've seen your family, your friends, and your neighbors dying mysteriously. Doctors cannot help the dying, so you feel helpless, you feel terrified, and death itself appears to be contagious. And now people in your community, perhaps, are whispering there's a possible cure, and maybe you should give it a try. Because they tell you, if you don't stop it in your family, it's going to take my family. So it wasn't just George Brown's problem. It was the community problem, which is why Everett Peck said, well, the 12 men in the family that was left got together and decided to do something. So the suggested cure seems horrific, but you know, really, what are your options? You do nothing and let your family surely die. Or you try this old remedy, and you hope that maybe it works. And what do you have to lose in the end? So what was this old folk remedy? Well, some people, outsiders, not in your community, they called it vampirism, or vampires. But you're not really concerned about what the outsiders call it, because the bottom line for you is the question, what do I have to do to stop the dying? Well, you begin by exhuming the bodies of the deceased relatives and checking them for signs considered to be extraordinary. In particular, you're looking for fresh blood in the heart or other vital organs. And liquid blood would be considered fresh blood. So that's what you're looking for, liquefied blood. And in the Mercy Brown case, you may be instructed to cut the heart from the body and burn it to ashes. And that was pretty common, that particular approach. And then you may even be told to feed the ashes to someone in the family who's suffering from consumption. Of course, since this is a folk remedy, there are, uh, there are <coughs> lots of different versions of it circula circulating around in different communities. Uh, most of the cures begin with removing and burning the vital organs, often just called vitals. Uh, particularly the heart, but sometimes also the liver and the lungs as well. And then perhaps, as in Mercy's case, ingesting the ashes. Other approaches include burning the entire corpse, sometimes inhaling the smoke, or standing in the smoke and being fumigated by the smoke from the burning corpse. Uh, or you could simply turn the corpse upside down and rebury it. Uh, searching for and destroying a vine is another approach. Sometimes burning the vine along with the vital organs, if you find it growing from the corpse or through the coffin. In, in some of the cases, if the vine grows from one coffin to the next, another person in the family is going to die from this disease. Or in other parts of America, outside of New England, you might remove the shroud from the mouth of the corpse. Uh, and perhaps, and I'm still tracking this one, one down, yes, driving a wooden stake through the heart. 
don't find that in New England, unfortunately. Sorry. <laughs> so what is commonly referred to as vampires or vampirism in these cases, I think we could call therapeutic exhumation. It's a real sexy term, isn't it? Can you imagine sparkly therapeutic exclamation? <laughs> no. I mean, basic folklore research shows many similar vampire stories distributed throughout the world. As we can see for this example from the vampire entry in the motif index of folk literature. And this really is a very small sampling uh, for several reasons. Primarily, the motif index mainly includes Mauritian or fairy tales and legends for the most part, or omitted from the, the motif index. And legends are really the, the most uh, important and the most common narrative vehicle for vampire stories. So the vampire narratives that are, uh, are closest to the American versions are found in Europe. No surprise, I guess. And the rituals described are not just similar, they're identical. A fact that strongly suggests, and this is a no-brainer, I guess, that European and American vampire practices share the same traditional foundation uh, is not surprising because of the European basis for European American culture in North America. Well, when I first published Food for the Dead, first edition in 2001, I was aware of about, of about 20 of these vamp so-called vampire cases in New England, and the doc documentation was pretty diverse. There were uh, eyewitness accounts, family stories, local legends, newspaper accounts, uh, local histories, town journals, uh, town records, personal correspondence, diaries, genealogies, gravestones, and as we'll see in a few minutes, even actual human remains. So at the time, 14 years ago, I thought I really had uncovered only a fraction of those that were actually undertaken, if you'll excuse the pun. <laughs> And now, I guess 14 years later, and thanks largely to the to electronic as access of a large number of databases, including old town records, uh, historic newspapers, and genealogical census and vital records, the number of exhumations I know has surpassed at this point 80, and it continues to grow. Fortunately, now more slowly so that maybe I have a hope of actually completing the book I'm writing on about this before I go back to Rhode Island in May. If I don't, please contact me through the email address you have in your little packet and say, Michael, get off your ass and start working. Because <laughs> <laughs> my wife says that all the time. So this is uh, the map of New England now with each bat representing uh, one of the cases that I found. And if it looks like the bats are flying out of Rhode Island, well, Raymond McNally did call Rhode Island the Transylvania of America. But it's mainly because Rhode Island is such a small state, so all of the cases take up the entire state with the big bats. And I hate to say it, Rhode Island, but Maine and New York State have now caught up and perhaps even surpassed you in the number of cases. So if you take all of this ev evidence together, it suggests that this practice probably was not uncommon in New England during the late 1700s and throughout the 1800s. And uh, as we're about to see, this practice was known and accepted, sometimes actually endorsed by the community at large by town authorities, and even by clergymen. According to an eyewitness account, 500 to 1,000 people were present in the town of Manchester, Vermont in 1793. I think you own this photograph, sir. <laughs> when the heart and lungs and liver of Rachel Harris Burton, Isaac Burton's first wife, were burned on the blacksmith's forge of Jacob Mead. It was an attempt to save Hulda Powell Burton, who was Isaac Burton's second wife. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it didn't work because she died less than six months later in September of 1793. 
The most explicit example of official endorsement comes from Cumberland, Rhode Island, the town council meeting of February 8, 1796, which gave Stephen Staples permission to exhume the body of his daughter, Abigail, to try an experiment, it said, in order to save the life of another daughter, the married daughter of Lavina Chase. Well, no matter what kind of experiment or, or ritual was performed, you know, it was indisputably a therapeutic exhumation or a vampire account, if you will. To me, the most remarkable new case I've uncovered since publishing the, the second edition of Food for the Dead comes from Belchertown, Massachusetts. It's in the Connecticut River Valley. In a letter to a friend in 1788, the town's congregational minister, Justice Forward, he was a minister for over 50 years in that town. He writes about embarking on a trip, a trip with his daughter, whose name coincidentally was named, whose name was Mercy, to a nearby town. He describes how she begins to hemorrhage, which of course caused him great concern, especially in light of the fact that three of his daughters had already died of consumption, and two others, including Mercy, were ill at that time. He writes, and I'm quoting from his letter that was written the day after this event. I had concluded about many, I had consulted many about opening the graves of some of the deceased to see whether they, there were any signs of the dead preying on the living. And though many advised to it and most thought it awful, yet Dr. Williams and some of the others spoke in such a manner about it that some of the family were not soon reconciled to it. However, they consented. So Reverend Folger goes on to describe how on the previous Friday, the grave of his mother-in-law was open. Quoting, she had turned over, or she had, she had been buried, excuse me, she had been buried almost three years, wasted away to a mere skeleton. It was suggested that perhaps she was not the right person. And so she was reburied. Reverend Ford continues in the letter, since I had begun to search, I concluded to search further. And this morning I opened the grave of my daughter who had died the last of my three daughters almost six years ago. On opening the body, the lungs were not dissolved, but had blood in them, though not fresh, but clotted. The lungs did not appear as we would suppose they would in a body just dead, know, but near a state of soundness than could be expected. The liver, I am told, was as sound as the lungs. We put the lungs and the liver in a separate box and buried them in the same grave 10 inches or a foot above the coffin. Unfortunately, the ritual did not save Mercy, who was already very ill, but three of his other children were spared. And by the way, this is another variant of the ritual. It's a unique one as far as I know. It's putting the, the burned remains in a box and burying it separately above the coffin. I haven't found this, these cases in Europe, but perhaps some researchers here can uh, point me in that direction. So, we have a clergyman who exhumes the members of his own family. We have a town council that endorses a therapeutic exhumation. We have hundreds, maybe a thousand, turning out to witness the heart burning, and we have medical doctors at the scene. Far from being New England's dirty little secret, as many, including myself at one time, might have thought, vampire exhumations in no way were little, nor were they secret. If they were dirty, it's simply because you have to get dirty when you dig up a corpse. <laughs> And vampire exhumations, in fact, were eagerly reported in newspapers across the country. And the same narrative would be published and republished again and again. For example, William Rose's exhumation of a son and daughter in southern Rhode Island in 1872 appeared in at least a dozen newspapers throughout the country. And eventually it even made its way beyond to Europe and I think in Australia, Anthony as did many other vampire incidents. Even well-known New Englanders knew about and commented on these uh, rituals. 
Henry David Thoreau recorded in his journal for 26th of September, 1859, the following. I have just read of a family in Vermont who, several of the members having died of consumption, just burned the lungs, heart, and liver of the last deceased in order to prevent any more from having it. Uh, Thoreau was probably referring to an 1859 case from Winhall, Vermont, which reads as follows. A Mrs. Prescott Lawrence of Winhall, Vermont, died a few days since of consumption and as a member of the family had previously died of the same disease, the family went through the superstitious <laughs> farce of burning the lungs, heart, and liver of the deceased to prevent any more from dying of the same disease. So you can see this text uh, is practically identical to uh, Thoreau's entry in his journal. And in the Vermont Vital Records, there is a married woman named Clarissa H. Lawrence, whose death in Winhall, Vermont, of pulmonary consumption was recorded on September 27, 1859, so probably referring to that case. And uh, I have to say that Thoreau's interest in this event was probably more than just morbid curiosity, because at the time of this entry in 1859, he knew he had consumption, and perhaps he was searching around and recording various possible cures, and he died of the disease three years later. So now we come to some actual physical evidence of vampire activity in New England. I got a phone call in 1990. This one area was really weird. The voice at the other end of the phone was saying, it looks like this guy was buried long enough to decompose, dug up, and some of his parts were rearranged, and then he was buried again. The voice belonged to Nick Bellantoni, who was a Connecticut state archaeologist and, and was until last year he just retired. And Nick said that he was aware of my research on the New England vampire tradition and thought I might be able to shed some light on this peculiar findings in Griswold, Connecticut, which is a town not too far over the border from Rhode Island. He told me that earlier in that year, in February of 1990, three boys were having a good time sliding down the slopes of the newly excavated section of a gravel mining pit about two miles from the village of Jewett City in Griswold. As one of the boys was descending, two human skulls seemed to fly out of the side of the pit and accompanied him down the slope. <laughs> yeah, it freaked them out. They were horrified. Uh, they did the right thing. They didn't take the skulls home and put candles on them to cool or, you know, something like that. They actually told their parents, and their parents told the authorities. And I think for a brief moment, when you look at the police report that was filed in this, they thought they might have found another serial killer in that area of Connecticut, and they had had one before. Uh, but closer examination revealed that it was probably the, the state archaeologist and not the medical examiner who should be looking at the remains since they appeared to be quite old. Well, Bellantoni's research revealed that the skulls were from an unmarked family cemetery uh, in use from, a, from 1757 to the early 1800s, when the members of this family, the Waltons, began a westward trek in search of better farmland. The cemetery continued to be used by another unidentified family until about 1830, after which it was abandoned, so the uninscribed field stone markers uh, were eventually reclaimed by the land and the Walton family cemetery faded from memory until this dramatic rediscovery by those boys in 1990. Well, when I visited the excavation, excavation which is about an hour's uh, drive from my home in Rhode Island, the archaeologists were in the process of unearthing about uh, 29 human remains from the cemetery. And all but one of these remains were bubble wrapped and stored at the University of Connecticut uh, awaiting reburial in another active cemetery in Griswold, the Hope Cemetery. Uh, the one exception was the weird burial, burial number four, that Nick Bellantoni had told me about on the phone. This particular individual had been sent to the National Museum of Health and Science in Washington, D.C., uh, where a, a forensic anthropologist named Paul Sledzik 
was investigating his remains. Well, the complete skeleton of this person, this man, happened to be the best preserved in the cemetery. And he'd been buried in a crypt that had been lined with stone slabs lining both the sides and the tops of the coffin. And there were some bricks even on top of the coffin. I mean, they really did not want this guy getting out of the grave. <laughs> and that was obvious just from the way he was buried. And on the lid of the hexagonal wooden coffin, an arrangement of brass tacks spelled out JB55, presumably the initials and age of this death of this individual uh, at the time of his death. Well, when the grave was opened, JB's skull and thigh bones were found in a kind of skull and crossbones pa pattern, the Jolly Roger. His femurs, or long, uh, large leg bones here, had been placed across his chest. His head had been removed. It was facing in the opposite direction of what, of what one would expect in New England. And also his ribs had been uh, disarticulated in various ways, not quite broken. And later analysis by Paul Slepsik in Washington of the, of the remains showed that there were lesions on his ribs, which indicated JB had a chronic pulmonary disease of some sort, probably TB, probably TB, consumption, yep. I don't think those are the cl those are the skull and cross and the uh, crossbone arranged legs. And you can see from the site map the edges of the gravel excavation, that's the dotted line. And you can also see that the buried, uh, some of the buried corpses had lost their heads, literally. Uh, a couple of which were probably the ones found by those boards sliding down the slope. And you can also see up there, with, next to JB, you can see IB. She had IB45 written on her wooden coffin. And NB, who had NB13, uh, also spelled out in brass tacks on the lid of the coffin. Uh, perhaps they were JB's wife and child. The child was a, a sub-adult, so it was too young to identify by sex at that time, but 13 indicates probably the 13-year-old child. So the three of us, Paul Slepsik, Nick Bellantoni, and, and myself, <coughs> put our heads together and tried to come up with a, the most likely scenario, which was, as a last resort, to save the family and perhaps also other people in the community and stop consumptions from spreading. JB's body was exhumed so that maybe his heart or perhaps his entire corpse could be burned. But when his body was actually unearthed, JB was found to be in an advanced stage of decomposition. Perhaps his ribs were invertebrate were in disarray because the people were kind of desperately looking for some vital organ that would be uh, sound enough to actually burn and carry out the ritual. Uh, finding no heart and with no flesh to burn, JB's skull and femur were rearranged, which is, I guess you could say, plan B. And folklore always has a plan B. Folklore always has a plan C. Folklore always has an answer. It may not be the answer that the scientists at that time think is correct. It may not be the answer that people in the community want to really hear. But there's always an answer out there somewhere in the community, passed around by oral tradition. Well, rearranging the skull, and that's his skull. JB had dental problems, as most people did at that time. He had a wound on his head that had healed before he died. He walked with a limp because he had broken his leg and it didn't set right. And he had arthritis, so he probably stooped over. So he was probably quite an imposing figure to people at that time. And a forensic artist named Sharon Long reconstructed on the basis of his skull what Jamie might have looked at like in, in real life. So stare into those eyes, because you may be staring into the eyes of an actual authentic vampire.
Well, I should note that there was a vampire exhumation in the same town of Griswold, Connecticut, about two miles from the JB burial in the cemetery of, uh, in the cemetery of, of Jewish cities, uh, of Jewish city. Three corpses were disinterred in 1854, and this is a pretty widespread story. You can find it in, I think, even in uh, Summer's books, the Ray family. Uh, the father and two sons were disinterred, and depending on which version of the narrative you want to believe, either both sons or one son were buried, uh, were burned entirely, the corpse. I believe the, the story from uh, about the one son, because it was written uh, as a response to the original story by a person who claims to have been an eyewitness. So probably just one son. But that lets us know that in the same town a few miles away, around the same time period, people were aware of these therapeutic exhumations. And also, removing the head and repositioning it, repositioning it, moving it around, perhaps at the foot of the core, uh, corpse sometimes or over the chest, uh, has precedent throughout Europe. Uh, even in Great Britain, this, these are from uh, Romano-British burials, third and fourth century. Some of them were post-mortem uh, post decapitations, that is, they were done after the corpses were buried. Some were done pre-mortem. It probably makes a difference in terms of the belief in what people were, were thinking. And decapitation seems to have been kind of like the go-to ritual in, in Poland. And it's even found in this country. 50 years apart, I found these two examples. In Berlin, Wisconsin in, in 1790, or 1872, uh, a man of Polish descent cut off the head and administered some of the blood as a medicine to a woman who was sick. Uh, it's, it's interesting that she had contracted smallpox and not uh, consumption. But this is also not from New England. So this is a, a different ethnic or cultural tradition. <clears throat> and as late as 1922, a Polish immigrant in Winona, Minnesota, had done a similar thing. He, five of his sons had died of consumption. Uh, the remaining son was very ill, so the father dug up a daughter and a son, and he was intending to remove the head of at least one of them and place it at the foot of the coffin. He determined that they had been too far decomposed, and so he, he didn't carry it out, but there was a big outcry for, for several weeks. You can follow the story in the newspaper. It's pretty incredible for that late. Well, a good question is, how did this folk tradition this vampire folk tradition, which was strong in Eastern Europe, but I'm going to say at least weak in Great Britain, get to New England, which was settled largely in the early years by people of English stock. I think this case from Willington, Connecticut, which incidentally is the earliest one I found, dating from 1784, provides some pretty convincing evidence. It's a letter written to a newspaper by Moses Holmes, who was one of the town selectmen in, the, in Willington, which is near Hartford, Connecticut. He writes, whereas of late there has been advanced for a certainty by a certain quack doctor, a foreigner, that a certain cure may be had for consumption, where any of the same family had before that time died of the same disease, directing to have the bodies of such that had died to be dug up, and further said, that out of the breast or vitals might be found a sprout or a vine fresh and growing, which together with the remaining remains of the vitals being re consumed in the fire would be an effectual cure in the same family. And such direction so far gained credit that in one instance the experiment was thoroughly made in Willington on the first day of June instant. Two bodies were dug up which belonged to the family of Mr. Isaac Johnson of, this, of that place. They both died with the consumption, 
One had been buried one year and 11 months, the other a year, a third of the same family then sick. On full examination of the thin small remains by two doctors present, namely doctors Grant and West, not the least discovery could be made. And to prevent misrepresentation of the facts, I being an eyewitness that under the coffin were was sundry small sprouts about one inch in length, then fresh, but most likely was the pro uh, produce of sorrel siege, which, followed, which fell into the coffin when put in the earth, and that the bodies of the dead may rest in quiet in their graves without such interruption. I think the public ought to be aware of being led astray by such an imposter, Moses Holmes. Well, the foreign quack doctor that Moses Holmes warned his townsmen against was quite a common sight in the Northeast at that time. Many of them were from Germany and other places in Northern and Eastern Europe. Uh, and they would travel, most beginning in the mid-Atlantic states around New Jersey and Pennsylvania, up into New England, selling their remedies. So the home remedies and the supernatural folklore that had been handed down in New England's own families and in their communities, mingled with the traditions of other groups. They were not isolated, as some people might think. And here, by the way, we see the cutting of the vine or plant motif uh, from the coffin that's growing inside the coffin. It's interesting that Moses Holmes tried to rationalize the, the vine, the seeds growing, saying, oh, that's just a natural thing. So <clears throat> supernatural, magical, spiritual, however you la label this particular folk culture. It was a taken for granted part of Americans' lives, even among educated and religious Americans. And that's going back, not just to colonial times, but continuing all the way through the 19th and 20th century, and in fact, even into the present. The prevailing general interest in, in supernatural topics, especially cures and, and healing, is recorded, for example, in newspaper advertisements like this, that show itinerant lecturers and strolling quack doctors who would set up shop in town and then leave when, of course, trouble started brewing, which was almost always a certainty because their cures did not always work, if that's perhaps an understatement. This was one who went from Newport to Providence and back. So certainly, the traveling quacks and the other purveyors of, of magical cures and insights, they weren't too interested in providing some sort of a rich cultural context for their product, where it came from exactly. Uh, I mean, there's an aura of being the mysterious foreign cognoscenti who was able to do things by tapping into an ancient, some sort of mystical magical wellspring of tradition. And their, their uh, clients, the people that they, if you want to call it, preyed upon, uh, they weren't too interested in the details of cultural background. Just the idea that they were mysterious and foreign was enough to sell the product to people. So we've looked at, at vampire cases spanning more than 100 years, just a few of the cases I've found, from 1784 to 1892. And I guess it's time to ask again, you know, what is a vampire? Well, a conception that seems to fit all of the vampires that appear in the folklore record, anywhere and everywhere, has been suggested by Paul Barber in his very insightful book, Vampires, Burial, and Death. You can see his definition. A vampire might be, designed, be defined as a corpse that comes to the attention of the populace at a time of crisis and is taken for the cause of that crisis. A corpse that comes to the attention of the populace 
at a time of crisis and is taken for the cause of that crisis. In other words, the classic scapegoat. So not knowing that the plague-causing vampire was a microscopic organism, people blame their deceased relatives. Their deceased relatives absorbed the guilt. The vampire, in other words, was the classic, classic scapegoat. to consider that definition for a minute. Some people take issue with that. I'm thinking perhaps of Anthony sitting over there. <laughs> I mean, should we or can we with justification assign the vampire label to every single corpse that becomes a scapegoat? Doesn't that open the door for ghosts, ghouls, any sort of revenant that returns from the grave. The grave. Well, folklorist Alan Dundas answered that question with a resounding no. In his vampire casebook, he wrote, widespread as the vampire is throughout Eastern Europe, the vampire is not universal by any means. Now, Dundas should have been aware of the New England tradition in his case book, which I think was published in 1998, but he doesn't address it. I mean, I think he was aware of it because in his bibliography, he cites Noreen Dresser's book that came out about 10 years earlier, American Vampires, in which he does mention, at least in three or four pages long, the, the New England vampire tradition. So I'm not sure why he was limiting the vampire belief to just Europe and not perhaps European colonized areas such as, such as America. But what I think we have is really a folk dichotomy. Um, on one side you have the European tradition, especially strong in Eastern Europe, in which the vampire practice is embedded in a rich cultural context. I mean, there are known cultural ways to avoid becoming a vampire. They, people know what it means when a cat steps over the corpse, or when someone accidentally eats the meat of a sheep that was killed by a wolf. I mean, you will turn it into a vampire. In fact, there seems to be, in some cases, more ways to become a vampire than not in parts of Eastern Europe. There were also ways to ward off vampires if somebody did become a vampire. There were ways to protect yourself from them. And barring all other <coughs> measures, there were, there were ways to kill vampires. So you had a full-fleshed, rich cultural tradition. In New England, what I think we have is, is the other side of the dichotomy. We have the bare bones, if you will, of the vampire tradition here. Um, what we have is the vampire tradition basically reduced down to a folk medical practice or cure, a curative ritual. Um, and I think that's a significant aspect, that both traditions share the means to identify and destroy the vampire. So in Central Europe's holistic cultural context, uh, the new, uh, It's embedded in, in social mores and cultural traditions that have been in place for hundreds, if not thousands of years. In New England, I think it was an imported tradition from Eastern Europe, probably several times by different groups of itinerant quack doctors. And then once in place in one, in one town in New England, it was spread to other places by people. I have evidence of like people with large cattle herds looking for uh, land to lease for their cattle, going to s different towns, and bringing with them this particular story. So once it was in place here in several different areas, I think it could spread by via the, the normal folk tradition of the oral tradition or even customary example, watching people do this. Um, so I think the pragmatic Yankees of New England were concerned with the bottom line in the end. What do I have to do to stop these deaths? Uh, and don't distract me 
with all those things, those other details that aren't directly relative to me taking care of the problem. And I think this approach is very much uh, in keeping with the functional Yankee, Yankee character and culture. Uh, simple with homespun taste, is forthright, it's plain spoken, like Everett Peck, if you remember his talk about Mercy Brown. Avoiding unnecessary ornamentation, yet also clever and able to create ingenious solutions to seemingly intractable problems like consumption death. So, as a folk medical practice, as opposed to a full-blown cultural tradition here. So now let's return to the question. This is the question uh, that was on the, this is a newspaper article that Eric uh, showed me, was Mercy Brown a vampire? Well, I think if you're focused on a thing and not a process, I think if you require a reanimated corpse, a corporeal being, a monster that actually leaves the grave, then you will assert that Mercy and her New England uh, cohorts were not vampires. But if you point to action, if you're interested in performance and process and procedure on the ritual rather than on the monster, then I think these New England exclamations were assuredly cases of vampires, just in a different simplified form. Well, I'd like to wrap up by reminding us, including myself, not to break our arms, patting ourselves on our backs about how smart we are. I mean, we have more knowledge, but we're in no way more intelligent than our ancestors of 200 years ago. And you know, desperate people who take desperate measures are not necessarily fools. Since the failure rates of Attempts to cure consumption were essentially the same for any medical system, whether it was folk, quack, establishment, which in reality was the same as doing nothing at all. Then people had little reason to reject any possible cure that was available. And I think it's important to consider that belief itself is not necessary in order for someone to take action in the face of almost certain death, just doing something might be enough. The dual nature of the folk healer and the quack, for that matter, who embodies both hope and doom, wasn't lost on the people of New England either. Yankee humor sometimes was ghastly. It reflected the harsh realities, such as disease and death, that they faced on a daily basis. And humor, can function as a way to stand back from terrible things in your life. You can laugh at your own misfortune. So jokes can be a coping mechanism. So let me leave you with a joke that was being told at the height of the consumption epidemic in New England. A peddler with his cart overtaking another of his clan on the road was thus addressed, hello friend, what do you carry? Drugs and medicines, was the reply. Good, retired, replied the other. You may go ahead. I carry gravestones. <laughs> <laughs>